Hi guys. Nope, not yet. Yep. Hi guys. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Um, tonight's session, a uh, follow up to the data that uh, I shared last week on the Crescent Nebula. Um, if you didn't catch that show, um, you can. Uh, why am I hearing that echo? Don't know why. Uh, I'm sorry. Hold on. I think that that's coming from someone in the room. I'm going to mute you guys. I'm really sorry. Uh, there we go. Um, so if you didn't catch that show, go back last week and uh, you could see my walkthrough of the Crescent Nebula processing. But the overall point to doing that wasn't just so that um, I can show you how I processed it. Uh, but uh, by sharing the data, I wanted to see how different everybody's rendition of it would be. And uh, they really were very different um but uh as always before i go into that what i am going to show off is this week's image of the week uh i am going to oh i don't want to do that let me do it this way uh even though you're going to see the infinite window uh <laughs> that's just an image i was checking out uh this week's image of the week was uh chris plosky's rendition of my data and I will tell you why I picked this particular image. Um, first of all, I like the overall color, but it really he really did a great job on a natural star color, which is what I think with bicolor is really the, uh, the benefit. You get that natural star color and that natural look while also using uh, the detail that you, uh, while also getting the detail that you get out of narrow band. Um, but I'm not going to talk too much about this because Chris is in the room and I hope in a few moments to have uh, a few of the processors comment on it. Uh, but uh, let me steal my window back. Okay. Um, so yes, uh, there were a few variations of it. Uh, I saw someone said they submitted it. Uh, Linda submitted it, and it didn't show up. I'm going to look on my end. I saw a few on the back end that didn't show up in the uh, in the front, but um, I didn't have a. I, I wasn't able to check whose was whose. Um, that said, uh, if you guys would like to see the data, I'm going to pull this up on my screen. But if you guys would like to see the data, stop paying attention to my screen, and um, just. Jump right over to the website, theastroimagingchannel.com. You're probably already there now. And check out the Image of the Week submissions. Uh, you're, I'm going to show you how to get there right now um, from the homepage of the website. Image of the Week right here, Image of the Week submissions. And you will see uh, all of the different renditions. Uh, starting from uh, one with a bit more red to it, one more accentuate, accentuating the halo, uh, a little bit more muted and uh, what I'll call um, a natural kind of look, um, somewhere in between. Uh, but uh, the way that I think is best to compare just the colors of these, I'm going to pull them up this way, and I hope you can see my Pix Insight screen. But I resized them. Um, just so you can see them all up here. I, and there's actually two, uh, one, two more um, that are posted on here. But uh, this really demonstrates what I was talking about. One person's going to have their vision for the data, and they're going to try and achieve that vision, and it's going to look completely different than somebody else's vision. Uh, you see seven different versions here. Uh, every one of them looks completely different. Uh, it's the same data, but every single one of them looks completely different. Uh, as I go through the, um, as I went through the website uh, and read how people process them, a lot of people use the same steps. A lot of people use PixInsight and they did basically what I would say is uh, the way I would do it. Uh, added a few things here, a few things there, but the way your eye, uh, says to you, now is when to stop with that curve. Now is when to stop with that saturation. I think that's what determines the, the individual images. 
Okay, that said, uh, the first one I showed off, I'm going to pull it back up onto my screen, but I know Chris had offered to talk about it uh, for a little bit. Uh, let me pull that. Uh, let me pull that back up. And Chris, uh, Chris Plonsky, tell us a little bit about what you did uh, with this image. And uh, let me, I might have you muted, so let's make sure I don't. Nope, you're no longer muted. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, what I basically do um, when I uh, process uh, uh, images and, and what I did with this one is I started out with a deconvolution. Um, and that's just to uh, just bring out any more detail that's available in each of the channels. Um, and I did each channel separately um, uh, for the deconvolution step. Um, and that uh, the the starting point of, of that is usually creating a, a mask uh, is how I do it. So I did a I created a mask for each one of the uh, channels. Uh, I masked the image, then I created some star masks uh, to uh, to uh, protect the stars a little bit when you do the deconvolution step because you don't want to get too much ringing um, in the stars. And of course, there's a lot of parameters to tweak in the deconvolution tool. Um, to avoid that, <clears throat> um, but you know, you tweak all that, and then you come up with uh, some previews that look good. And if you like it, then you apply it to the entire image. And then I did that for each of the channels. Created the the masks that I used later because the masks are really important in um, fine tuning the colors later. So you know, you, you don't delete the masks after you do the deconvolution. Um, the next step is, of course, doing the color combination. And I did a, a little bit of a twist from uh, what you shared, Adam, last week. Um, for the green channel, uh, instead of doing percentages of H alpha and uh, O3, uh, I did. I found a, a formula online that looked interesting, and I tried it. And at first, it looked kind of scary. Uh, but it was a HA times uh, O3 times 1.5. And it ended up with a significantly magenta image, but when I did the background neutralization afterwards, it looked pretty close to what you're seeing right here. And it was like, whoa, I like that. Um, I tried the other uh, combination uh, similar to what you shared, and uh, it, it looked great too, but it didn't quite have the, uh, the, the color, particularly the blue um, I liked in this. And then, um, so anyway, so that was that, that step, and then um, uh, in creating the star mask, I did kind of a combination of the regular star mask tool plus using the uh, uh, MLT, the uh, 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 tool in PixInsight, to um, uh, do the lower wavelet layers uh, and removing the the nebula, basically. And they, you get like an image of the stars, and then you use the uh, uh, histogram transformation tool to kind of bring those up to a, a a good nonlinear level to match the other stars, uh, and that gives you a mix of the the brighter ones and the dimmer stars. Because uh, the star mask tool just by itself, it's it's hard to get uh, everything, <laughs> uh, the the bigger and the smaller stars. So uh, I combined those then with uh, pixel math uh, using the max uh, function, where you use the maximum value of either the star mask or the of, of one that I did with the wavelet layers, um, and then it, it produced a, a combination mask, uh, which was kind of nice because I, I also did not use the binary binarize uh, checkbox in the star mask tool. So I, I kind of had various levels of, of masking for the stars depending on their brightness, which would helped in uh, maintaining good star color uh, later. So uh, when when I Got to the point where I created it. Uh, oh, there's uh, one other step I do when I when I do not uh, go to nonlinear. I almost never use the screen stretch uh, uh, theoretical settings. You know how you how you do the screen uh, auto uh, <laughs> sorry the auto screen stretch, uh, and then you drag the little triangle over to the, the histogram transformation. I sometimes use that as a starting point, but I always look at the the amount of, of dark uh, pixels that are clipped. And I try to keep that to either zero or a very, very uh, minimum. 
But when you do that, because yeah, the, the, the reason I want to do that is so that I don't remove too much detail in the dark. And um, so um, when you do that, however, you end up with fairly bright darks initially. So you have to darken them up somehow. So I've kind of developed this uh, black compression scheme by uh, taking that image, duplicating it, then using one as a mask for the other, uh, inverting it, and then you use the uh, histogram transformation tool to compress basically the blacks instead of clipping them off. And so it still makes the image darker, uh, but you don't end up losing as much detail in the darks, like all the dust and, and, and uh, the details in the background. Uh, so I found that to be more useful than, than uh, just using the uh, a screen stretch tool uh, recommendations, as I would call it, <laughs> alone, because that tends to clip a lot of the blacks out uh, unnecessarily. And so you, you lose some detail in there. Uh, but after you do that, um, then you take your original masks that, or the, that I used for the deconvolution tool. And then so I'll take the H alpha mask. And then I can use the curves tool um, to, you know, bring up the reds a little bit since I used H alpha for red. Uh, and then I'll switch to the O3 mask and, uh, you know, bring up the blues until it looks good. Um, but when you do that, however, you end up with an artifact uh, where uh, if your mask includes the stars, which it probably does, uh, when you bring up the blues to where it looks good in the nebula, your stars tend to be really, really blue. <laughs> so to get around that, you can take your star mask that was created, the combo star mask, uh, and subtract it from the, the uh, mask itself. So basically you end up with little holes where the stars go. So when you got your star color pretty decent, you don't want to blow it out when, when you bring out the details in the nebula. So uh, uh, you, you create the little holes basically in the, uh, in the uh, channel masks, uh, and then you use that as your mask when you're using the curves tool. So you can you know, freely adjust the colors of the nebula without hardly affecting the stars. You do affect them a little bit because you used a, a you know, more linear star mask rather than a, a binarized uh, star mask. So it does give you a little bit more uh, color definition in the stars as well, but it doesn't make them, you know, go crazy, you know, crazy colors in the stars, which uh, you tend to end up with sometimes. Um, and then you basically just fine tune that and maybe fine tune the uh, the histogram transformation tool at the end to uh, get get your your levels just right. Oh, I also to bring out some of the detail in the nebula. Um, I know you used a few different tools last week to try to get uh, some of the the, uh, the dark areas uh, more pronounced. Most of those tend to make it look a little too too pronounced to me. Uh, but there's that um, uh, what is it called? The uh, no, a dog on it. it. It's a, uh, um, a CLE something. Here, let me bring up PicSense. I'll tell you right away. <laughs> Stand by here for just one second. If I'd already had it open, I guess it would have helped. The local histogram equalization tool. And, and that's a pretty good one because what you can do is you can create a little preview so, so you're not trying to transform the entire image. And then it's got a little preview window uh, that you can open up. So, so you create a preview, you do the little preview window for the local histogram equalization tool. Then you can tweak the kernel radius, uh, which kind of picks which details you want to emphasize. And then you can do the contrast limit. I usually bring that down pretty low so that it's not too contrasty. Um, and, and then uh, when, when you get your preview just the way you want it, um, then uh, yeah, and then you can tweak that little kernel radius size. Uh, and then of course the amount, uh, you bring that down to where it looks reasonable. And then when you get it to where it looks, kind of gives it a nice depth, but not crazy, you know, over-processed, 
then you can apply it to the entire image and it tends to uh, give you a nice little uh, uh, addition without without getting too cartoonish looking like some of the uh, the tools like the uh, um, eight, um, <laughs> what's the other one that everybody uses uh, HDR multi-scale transform that one tends to get a little crazy sometimes uh, when you're trying to do subtle details um, so so I, I try not to use that one too much and then the there's the dark enhancement script which works pretty good uh, but on some objects like this one, I, I also wasn't happy with the results of that because it made it look a little too cartoonish. So I think it, I got a, a, a happy balance just using that uh, 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 local histogram equalization tool um, to, to enhance the details a bit. Uh, but that was pretty much all I did with this image. Uh, mo most of it was spending time with the curves and masks to, uh, to get the stars and the um, the uh, uh, image is the right color. And of course, uh, noise reduction. I did the noise reduction using the invert mask. So you, you're reducing the noise in the, in the darks. And then sometimes, believe it or not, <laughs> and it almost seems like sacrilege to do so, uh, I use the actual mask, uh, not inverted, and I'll use the ACDNR extremely light on the foreground image and it reduces some of the noise in the foreground and still retains the details that are there. If, if, you're, if you're not careful with it, you can remove all the details. Uh, but it does tend to make it look a, a little bit more natural when you do that rather than stark. So uh, I, do, I do that sometimes as well. And I did on this image a little bit. Yeah, that, yeah. That's pretty much it. I love the local histogram tool when it uh, local histogram equalization when it kind of works how you want it. And I don't think I used it uh, in that last image because sometimes it does kind of get out of control. Yeah, um, it's very easy. Yeah, but um, just for pulling that contrast, like basically throughout, it's almost the perfect tool for this nebula. And uh, I'm sorry for uh, jumping on your data and processing it. I just. Uh, <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> cool, and I said I might as well pull it up while he's talking about it. Sure, sure. I'm sharing my sharing my screen. You um, know, believe it or not, I tried to save all my process, uh, and then I accidentally closed it all after I got done with the images. Like, oh no! <laughs> so I, I could have showed you exactly what I did, but you know, I tried to explain it as best I could from memory. So. Yep. All right. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, congrats on the image of the week. Um, I am gonna jump back over to my screen uh, and get rid of that infinite window. There we go. Um, now I know David is in the room and David also processed and offered to uh, talk a little bit about it. Uh, David, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, tell us what you did. Yeah, so let me uh, share my screen here. All right, so uh, this was uh, my attempt with your data, I had a couple goals, uh, you know, after after looking at your data. One, I wanted to get the uh, the O3 shell so that it was visible but didn't take away from the HA details in the middle. Uh, so you could see some of the wispy, you know, parts of the O3, but you could clearly see it was an envelope around the interior part of it. And I wanted to get the, the shock waves at the outer portions uh, showing up as kind of this orangey uh, flame color, right? Uh, those were kind of my primary goals here with the, the appearance I was trying to go for. Um, uh, I, I also tried to get a lot of detail out of it um, without going too far, uh, both in the inside the, in, the nebula and, and in the shell. Uh, I used a few different techniques there and uh, my, my take is I actually pushed it a little too far. I lost a little bit of detail in the background and the stars start to look a little bit funny, but um, overall, you know, I think, think it's a reasonable, reasonable pass. Um, but uh, you know, the, the things I did here, you know, I, you'll, you'll see my project windows. They tend to have a fair not, amount of things going on at one time. You'll see, I have a bunch of process icons and, you know, various states of image or masks and stuff at the bottom. So when you look through the histories of things, so I started off with uh, 
you know, this is the first uh, color version of, of your data, I believe, here. Um, so, you know, there was several steps in processing that, uh, including some cropping and uh, stretching and stuff in there. And the last part was a final um, stretch, um, which you can see was, I think this was actually a, uh, a masked stretch on it. But before I did the mass stretch, I actually split it off and did several other stretches. Um, so there's uh, these other versions of it. Copy, you know, clone one, clone two, clone three. Um, you can see clone one was a straight histogram transfer stretch. Uh, clone two uh, was a uh, hyperbolic arc sine stretch. Uh, clone three. Uh, was a pixel math stretch. I can't remember exactly what I did with this one. Um, but, uh, you know, then I'll take a blend of those to create a final image uh, that I, you know, is in the nonlinear state at that point. So everything before that is getting up to the nonlinear. I didn't do any deconvolution with this because I wanted to kind of play with uh, a couple other things on the back end for bringing out detail just to see what I could get out of them. Um, so, you know, after I had all those different color versions, I combined them together in this uh, this image that we're looking at now. So you can see one of the first states is a pixel math expression where I'm blending some of the clones and stuff together. Um, you know, I started going off doing some color saturation and stuff, bringing out the colors a bit more. Um, those are probably tuned. Yeah, it looks like I've got a peak here near the blue, so I was bringing out the blues a bit more. Um, doing some blends here, you can see I'm doing a blend with a noise reduced version using a noise reduced mask. So that is uh, this guy here. So I made a clone of the image. I probably, I think I did TGB denoise on that. So if I look at the NR image, uh, go back to that one. Look at the uh, history for NR. Yeah, you can see I did TGV denoise on it um, to the noise reduction. And then I blended with a mask. And then typically I'll blend with a mask and with a non-masked version. Uh, so I can, can kind of control how much I want the blur to from the noise reduction to affect the, the, the details in the brighter areas uh, versus the darker areas. So it looks like it actually did three passes of that in various amounts. Um, then I did, you know, a little more stretching uh, after some of the color satura saturation and stuff. Um, didn't like exactly where the background colors are going, so I re-neutralized re them. And then I actually did some unsharp, unsharp max, uh, masking, which is effectively a detail enhancement. Um, uh, with, a, with a controlled mask, you can see it's a version of the noise-reduced mask. Um, with all the stars removed. I think, Chris, you were talking about do doing something like this where you basically subtract the star mask. Um, so, you know, this is effectively controlling, you know, what parts of the image can be uh, enhanced. Um, and then I did a whole bunch of other ones. I'd actually done a couple playing around with high pass filter stuff in Photoshop, and I tried a couple different versions in PixInsight, both with uh, um, the local histogram equalization and multi-scale median transform. And I like different aspects of each of them, so I ended up blending all of those three, uh, and that became my high-pass filter input. Uh, and I used that uh, to kind of blend in in a couple different ways. Did a little bit more noise reduction on the image. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, this one was actually another form of noise reduction using pixel math and a little bit more sharpening. Uh, and then the rest is all kind of clean up, uh, controlling some of the stars and their color and their brightness. Um, you know, sometimes I'll do a morphological trans transformation to reduce the stars size of the stars, which I think we'll see in here somewhere. And sometimes I'll actually do um, a slight blurring on them as well to kind of get the peaks of the stars to come in so you see a little bit more color on the peaks. 
uh, and I may change the intensities of the stars a little bit using the star masks. Uh, and then at the very end, I still wasn't exactly pleased with, um, you know, there was a little bit too much green in it for me, so I, I backed that off with a, an SCNR uh, to kind of switch the, the greens to blues a little bit more. Uh, and that's pretty much what I what I did here. Awesome. Thank you, David. Um, so it's interesting. Uh, we all looked at the data or looked at the process of it. Uh, let me steal back my camera. There we go. Looked at the data, looked at the process of it. And um, everyone had a different vision for it. Um, I, I, I think what David said about uh, accentuating that shell, but also the uh, shock waves on the front and, and the, the back or the top and bottom. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just funny how uh, everyone's going to look at something and want to pull something else out. And that's what kind of inspires us to, to go with it. Um, Alex, did you have uh, anything to say about your process? Because I can pull it up and you can give me a, a quick uh, rundown of what you did. I don't, uh, you might be muted. I don't hear you right now. Or he might not be in front of his computer right now. You're muted, it looks like, Alex. I see you trying. There we go. There we go. Yep. Uh, I should be screen sharing right now. How yes. come I'm, oh, I know because of the delay. Um, oh, because I haven't started Pixel site yet. There we go. Is that right? Yep, now I see it. Okay. Um, I think the first thing that you get out of a lesson like this is, uh, and I was impressed with uh, both the presenters so far, uh, telling us about they wanted to do something. And I think it's important to know that you want to do something before you start processing. Um, remember Michelangelo looking at the slab of marble that nobody wanted, that the Medici's owned? And he said that he could see David in there, and it was his job to pull David back out of it. And all he had to do was remove the stuff that you didn't need and stuff to, in order to pull it out. And that's, that's probably one of the lessons you can get from seeing, uh, what is it, eight different representations of the same set of data. I can tell you that what I did was I uh, first went to the original um, uh, uh, data that um, Adam had and I, download, and I downloaded it, obviously. And the first thing I did was I, uh, I got a mask, made up a mask of, for just the stars and uh, uh, shrunk the stars with morphological transformation. I didn't bother with um, the things that I normally would have had to do with data. I think Adam had already done that, you know, cleaning it up, get rid of gradients and stuff like that. I didn't see any in there, so I didn't worry too much about that. Um, then I combined them. Uh, I combined them about half and half. Uh, the same kind of pixel math that Adam used last week, but instead of uh, going with the um, um, two tenths and eight tenths hydrogen alpha versus um, O3 to make the um, uh, uh, to make the RGB image, make the green channel, um, I decided to go about half and half because I wanted um, more of the red of the hydrogen alpha. I wanted more of it in there. And so uh, my formula was half and half for the uh, hydrogen alpha and the O3. And when I did that, I got an image that looked, oh gosh, I don't even know where it is now. It might be easier to show you over in the, uh, over in uh, Photoshop. I got an image that looked about like that. Okay. And I was, um, I was fairly happy with that, but it still wasn't doing some of the things I wanted to do. I didn't, in general, like the color here. So what I did was, and I don't know where that went, I thought I saved it with the, um, with the various uh, elements here. I basically selected over in here. Uh, oh yeah, then, then I went and combined them um, with the pixel math and I um, uh, did a regular histogram stretch on it and got to basically this and brought it back over to Photoshop out of uh, PixInsight. Then what did I do? I um, 
Oh, I went to selecting, and I'm not going to be able to do exactly what I did before. Selecting color range, though, and um, I tried to get this background stuff and select a lot of the background stuff like this. Let me make sure I get this here. Okay, and I selected that. Uh, I hope I left my fuzziness up there. Get rid of the ants. Uh, and then I copied. And it shows up in another um, layer up here. I just made a background copy so that in case I screw up, I could just go back. I, I haven't messed with the background at all. And as you can see, I've got all this stuff back out here, that stuff that I wanted to make more red. And I basically brought that red up a little bit. And by changing the color of the... Um, the color balance, I was able to get a little more red out of there that I that and that's what I want to do. I actually got too much of it now in retrospect. But in retrospect, I think we'd all process things differently as we went along. But basically, I wanted a little more red in there. And um, so I got it. That's a little too much. I'm doing this freehand now. I was a little bit more careful this morning when I did it. And I got some of that. Then I wanted to emphasize some of this area in through here. So I went back and I, again, um, copied it. And what I'm doing is I'm holding the shift key down as I copy part of it. And you can see that I've now selected the nebula, as it were, and I'm gonna, um, Copy it and paste it. So I've got it up here. And then I, uh, what did I do with it then? I think I just, oh, one of the things I did was I sharpened it a little bit by a, um, high pass filter. That's a bit much in a high pass filter, 270. Oh, sorry about that. Forgot to change this to blending mode to soft light. Now go to the filter. And remember last week we were talking about bringing out the um, some of those details up there. Now, this is not exactly what I did before because I'm doing it much more quickly now. The one thing that I like doing when I'm looking for particular pieces of, of sharpness, at, and over here, you got the sharpening tool, and, and uh, so you pick the sharpening tool, put the strength at about 50% up here, and go ahead and pick out parts that you want sharper and sharpen them up. It'll make them stand out. Now, be careful with this tool. Don't use it at 100% because it'll basically look like you've done unsharp masking. And so you pick out all those things that you'd like to stand out a little bit. If you do it just right, and it's hard to do it just right, but if you do it just right, you can almost get a three-dimensionality effect out of it by just picking out the parts that you really want to bring out and because they're different sharpness than other things, they show up a little bit better. And uh, I didn't like when I when I was all finished. I went back over to um, to uh, what's that other program I use a lot? No, that, that one. And I came back over here and I adjusted the saturation a little bit, used a little bit of remove green and that kind of stuff. And that's how I wound up where I am here. Okay. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you, Alex. Um, I'm glad you used uh, Photoshop a bit because, um, uh, how do I say this? Uh, you can get good results no matter which program you use. Yeah. Uh, it's just a matter of learning that particular program and being proficient enough in it to have the vision and execute the vision, right? Um, 
and that's kind of what we're doing here is trying to get you to see the the general workflow. Uh, yeah, I can go from a, a pre-processed stacked image uh, and bring it in and color calibrate and work, work my way through, get the noise out. And from there, uh, work on the detailing that I want or the coloring that I want. Um, but it's still, uh, it, each image is going to look unique. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember, um, I don't know, I, I don't know if it was just me or if it was just more of a overall perception, but, uh, people used to talk about the Pix Insight look and what's the Pix Insight look. And, um, I always, when I saw an image that I thought was processed in Pix Insight, I always noticed based on the star color. Uh, I think Pix Insight, from what I saw, did a better job of pulling out star color and having that gold to blue. Um, that said, uh, as I think people picked up on that star color and we started talking more about star color, a lot of people tried to get that look in Photoshop. Uh, so uh, it's there's no uh, there's no right look or wrong look it's just a matter of making it look good um let's see i've got 1006 so it's a little early to end tonight uh hey i wanted to stop hey, can i can i interrupt here hey last yeah. week um one or two people put in questions as we were winding up um uh, and yeah we don't mind answering questions that are not nominally on the topic um we don't mind that at all as you probably know you've seen us do that but uh, you got to get them in there early because um, what we're trying to do is present stuff and we're trying to talk. And at the same time, we're trying to read what you have to say. And frankly, we can get a little bit lost doing that. So please, if you've got any questions, get them in now. Don't wait till later because we might, you know, go right on by them. Okay. Um, and speaking of that, Linda had asked if you can change the fits. Oh, this was from last week, wasn't it? That was from last week. Yeah. Yeah, and, and why don't you go ahead and answer that question? Yeah, Linda, do uh, I, I know Linda's in the room, so am I sure? And, and and by the way, she's gotten the answer to her question. I've I've swapped okay. emails with her back and forth since then, okay. but I'm not sharing my screen. But let me answer the question either way. Uh, so uh, let me get a fits file with something in the uh, header. All right, uh, so fits file. Uh, basically, you want to use the fits header tool. Um, and you can pull up the image. And then if I scan down there, you see light right there. I believe all you have to do is change that right there to dark. And uh, I believe click replace, uh, and then you're done, right? Yeah. Adam, you don't even have to do that. Hey, let me uh, let me share a screen here. Um, where am I? Uh, it's a lot easier than that, actually. You, you just go into the uh, uh, basic reprocessing program. Okay, I'm sharing my screen, and let's see, what uh, what screen do I have up there? There's my Pix Insight screen. Um, uh, under script. Batch pre-processing, um, okay, you open up batch pre-processing and um, I'm gonna, um, I wanna add some biases and uh, here's some flats. Aren't they lovely flats? And just open them, boom. They, they went into biases because I told them I was adding biases. So if you've got flats that were taken with the name lights, you just put them in there. When you want to add some darks, um, I'll go grab these darks. Well, let me let me make sure that they're the same bidding level. They aren't. Uh, let me add these four or five. These are flats, pretty obviously. And just open them up, and boom, they went into darks. That's one way of doing it. Just, just put them in there. You don't have to correct what the fits header says. That's one way to do it. You can also go to add custom. And in this case, any files you add, let's say I'm gonna add all of these files and they are flats again. 
okay? But I'm gonna tell them that they are in fact light frames. And I'm gonna tell it, uh, I could tell it that this is the luminance. And the binning is three by three. And the exposure time is 1.58. Boom, it goes in there and now they're in they're under lights. So just go into the batch pre-processing and I would imagine you can do that with any of the other uh, individual processes, okay? Um, it, the, if you tell it you're adding biases, it thinks they're biases no matter what is in the FITS header file for it, okay? But I'm trying but, to... But, but if you want to use it again later, you have to do what Adam says. If you want to do it without going these through these convolutions here. Yeah, I'm trying to think because I ran into a scenario where uh, I wasn't able to use the add custom. And I don't know if it had something to do with the filter. Uh, maybe if, it, it was that same thing. Right. Um, if I, you go I, to just if you go to just a generic add files. Mm -hmm. And you tell it to add a bunch of files, and the fits header does not say what they are. Mm -hmm. Then it will say, "I can't do that because I don't know what they are." Mm -hmm. So then you have to do what Adam says. But I think Linda's situation was that she was, she had told them they were lights or something like that, when in fact they were flats. Mm -hmm. So just go ahead and put them into flats. Okay, if your files have a fits header that they know what kind of file it is in the fits header, that's where it'll go when you add files. Okay, if you uh, if you just tell it, take one of these others, add bias, darks, whatever, whatever, then it will go into that. If you wanna tell it what it's gonna be, uh, then you can go to add custom also. Yeah, I think what happened is um, or where that can run kind of a foul is uh, if you're taking your darks, but you accidentally have flats checked, then it's going to associate a filter with your darks, and it's going to try and pull that filter in even custom. So it can apply those darks to every file you have in there. Uh, okay. In other words. Uh, if it has the R filter associated with it, it's only going to apply the darks to the red lights um, because it kind of splits them out that way. I think that's what, what I ran into. And I actually had to go in and modify the fence header. Um, um, Linda and I swapped emails back and forth. And um, I actually, cloudy night PMs. And uh, she got it all figured out. Great. But it's a common problem because we all yeah. do, uh, we all do stupid stuff at uh, 2 a.m. in the morning, right? Mm -hmm. um, awesome. So let's see. I don't see any other comments. Uh, does that for the Deep Sky Stacker process? I'm not quite sure what it is, uh, whether it's auto or associate. Uh, Guillermo has a question related to SGP's camera rotation. Uh, suppose he has a 10 object sequence where all objects have been framed and listed with a 90 degree camera angle setting. If he alters the camera angle in the middle of the sequence, will Sequence Generator Pro stop everything until I move the camera from its original starting angle, or will it continue doing its thing with a different angle? Uh, depends on you have it, how you have it set up. Um, uh, if you don't have a rotator on there, then you can do, I don't remember how they phrase it, but it's like manual rotation confirmation where they actually expect you to physically rotate your camera. Um, and then it'll play solve and confirm that it's properly rotated. Uh, I, I'm, it's not called manual camera rotation, but it's something like that. Uh, I don't have my laptop open. Um, Obviously, if you have a rotator, it does it all for you uh, altogether. Now, if you don't have a rotator and you don't want it to stop everything for you to move your camera angle, uh, camera rotation, uh, it's, it's 
basically just a matter of clicking a checkbox and it doesn't wait to confirm the camera angle. Uh, that's the way I do it because uh, I don't have a rotator. And for the most part, uh, I just, <clears throat> unless it's a really specific target that I want to frame a specific way, uh, I don't rotate my camera that often. Um, is that it for the questions? We had a 45-minute session today. It's not too bad. Uh, next week, um, assuming all goes well, Alex is going to tell us a bit about how he photographed almost the entire Messier. No, I got them all. I got them all. Okay. Hey, um, yeah, no, uh, really what I'm going to be talking about is some advanced um, uh, options to program Sequence Generator Pro. The excuse I'm going to use is that if you ever wanted to take all 110 objects in the same night, here's how you'd go about doing it. So it's just a teaching vehicle to um, get you set up for uh, importing targets from the um, from the Mosaic Wizard, from Astro Planner, and various other things, um, and um, how to time your sequence so that it you know it'll wait at certain points for certain things to happen, um, and and stuff like that. Awesome. That's going to be a good show. Uh, but that's it for tonight. Uh, guys, thank you all for uh, processing the data, for sharing what you did. Um, and I, I think uh, we had enough responses to this that we're going to try and do it again. Uh, hopefully, I'll get uh, some even, even better data shortly. Uh, or maybe we'll process a different type of object. I did realize after the fact that uh, with a bicolor object, it is going to look pretty similar. Um, I guess uh, three channels, three color channels can uh, make it look a lot different than just using two channels. Uh, so next time we'll try either a tricolor narrowband or an RGB narrowband. We'll see. Uh, but uh, you know what's coming next week. Uh, hope to have some good stuff in the following weeks. And uh, Neef is coming up. And, uh, well, you'll see as we post it. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, good night. See you next week.